Um, oh, we have questions. Yeah, we have questions. Well, you know what? Actually, allowed? I think um, it's 5.30, so I think we can open it up to questions, because I would imagine you guys have a lot. So um, did we have a microphone somewhere? <laughs> Alright, if you guys want to line up, if you have questions, just have them line up in the hall. Yeah. Wait, here we go. Sorry, we're just doing it. Sorry, we just joy out. Hi, everybody. Hello, Um. So, my question was. I guess this kind of goes to Mary, but honestly, Becky and Lux too, um, as more traditional or traditional media artists, how do you guys stay relevant and, um, I don't want to say compete necessarily, but like um, go against or alongside digital artists? Because I feel like as a watercolorist, I have pressured myself into learning digital art over the last year. And starting back from square one and almost relearning how to draw has been such a like uh, punch in the ego. It's so like wonderfully sad. So I just wonder how, as a traditional artist, you motivate yourself to feel like your um, your thing has relevancy in such a digitally complex and centered art world. Um, first off, I like your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, I, I honestly think like some of that is like a, it's a confidence thing and. Uh, it's important to remind yourself that in such a digital world, people are hungry for real things. And I feel while digital is popular and a lot of people are interested in learning how to make digital art, people are far more impressed when they see like, you made that with real paint? Um, I think if anything, it's, it, it's an advantage. I don't want to say it's better than or going to be more successful, but I, I think if you treat it as an advantage rather than a hurdle, that can totally like help give you this push. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, um, I think digital art is beautiful and fantastic, but it's just something that I'm currently not very good at. But what we said earlier, which I think rings true, is that there's different types of art. So you don't have to feel pressure to do every single type of medium because some people literally just focus on one one area and that is their thing and that's fantastic for them. So I try not to think about it too much. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm um, an art yes, educator. I do. I work at a museum, and I also my channel is on. Um, I don't create art, but I um, talk about art, and I, I try to help people understand art. And so my question is, what are what is something that you guys think is are like misconceptions about what you do, or about creating art in general that you think? Uh, people should understand and also ideas from my next videos. <laughs> um, I, th I think a big misconception is that art is unattainable and untouchable and um, and like unfortunately like especially like if you go to a museum and you see it on the wall and people are like don't touch it. Like, people feel like it's off limits and it's in a high tower and um, and yeah, I, I guess like it'd be nice for people to know that it's it's much more accessible. We just don't let you touch it on the wall because it's a one of a kind, and that person put love and effort into it. I guess um, the idea or the notion of, of of understanding art is something that maybe we don't really think about very much. I don't think that all art needs to be understood or people interpret it in three different ways. And the way we sort of think about it is that if people think about what we do and it comes across in a certain way to them, then that's correct you know, to them. That's fine. And so they will have their own different interpretations and, and they're all sort of equally valid. I agree. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, hi. Um, this is mainly for Becky and Drew. I'm a pretty big fan of Don't Have Me, I'm Scared. Um, I was just wondering, so I know you guys spoke about putting it up on YouTube first and sort of continuing through that so you have more control over it. Um, it seems like it's such a high production value um, video series. Is it something that you 
had offers to like continue? Like, have you are you thinking of doing things like in something outside of YouTube or like even sort of expanding to that like those other platforms? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something that we're, we're, we've thought about and are thinking about. And the show sort of engulfs all of that time, and so we've never really had time to think past like the series. But I think now that we've finished the final show, it's definitely something that um, we we want to carry on in some way. Um, cause I think there's a lot of potential there to expand. And, yeah, maybe we could do a musical as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, what do you do when you guys are feeling like uninspired and like everything you draw just doesn't work? What are some tips that you do to push yourself to like become inspired again? Um, I think sometimes if you push yourself too hard, that at least for me. That that's when you can become uninspired. I think it's okay to step away from art sometimes and be like, you know what, dude, I need a break. Like, I just need to not even focus on anything at all in the world. And I feel like when I stop focusing on anything I'm trying to do, that's when inspiration comes to me the most because my mind isn't clouded with everything else. It's not clouded on, oh, this video didn't turn out or this painting didn't turn out or, ah, oh, everything's going wrong. It's just a matter of basically relaxing, and for me, that's how inspiration comes back. Agreed. Some people think I'm watching lots of uh, videos and things that are overwhelming because it suddenly feels like there's lots of competition. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, I, I do find it fascinating watching other people's stuff, especially um, with YouTube, there's such a vast amount of stuff on there, and also Tumblr's pretty good mm -hmm. at finding things. I mean, not necessarily art, you can just, you know, see photos and stuff like that. It's amazing what things can inspire you without you having to leave your room. And I know that sounds pretty bad because we're trying to get people to leave their room and be inspired by the outside world. But yeah, I mean, your computer is a great way of accessing things that you might be able to see in the direct uh, world around you. one kind of video and then introducing something a little different. Um, I ran into that thing where it was like a little too mysterious and I was just a hand and I'd started a second channel for vlogs where I felt I could communicate directly and talk about things that aren't art and it, there wouldn't be that expectation and I've slowly been introducing that into my main art channel. Um, showing a little bit more the face or like having an explanation of the materials or something where I talk directly uh, to the audience and just like not like boom surprise them with a vlog but like ease them into the idea of now I will talk to you and about the art and then ease that into who I am. Yeah, I totally agree with Mary. I mean, introduce yourself. Why not? You know, might as well. I mean, you're the one that's making the art, and like, I always say, creativity is who I am. Like, that's like my main thing. So, your art and everything that you do is just a part of you, it's part of who you are. And I think that's a way to explain it to people is that, like, as an artist, that's you. So, like Mary was saying, like, you know, introduce your art, explain maybe why you're painting something like this, how it's relevant to your life, what inspires you, and people are going to be interested in that. Maybe it might not get as many views as your normal videos because it is different content. It is something else, but if it's something you want to do, do it. You just see a lot of it. Lex, I wanted to ask you because you, um, about a year and a half into your channel, I, I watched a lot of your videos. Yes. Um, you, so she does makeup tutorials, and um, at first it was text on the screen. 
telling you how to do it, and now it's voiceover. So why did you decide to make that change? And okay, so <laughs> <laughs> well, for a while, people are like, Lex, I literally do not want to read the instructions. I'm like, too bad. I don't want to do voiceovers. Then I started doing it because you know what? Um, it is also introducing yourself in a way. Um, people get to listen to what you have to say and trying to write things down in text for instructions. Man, let me tell you, I can say so much more in five minutes than I can write. I can tell you that people cannot read that fast. So it was just easier to do the voiceovers and also it's just more personal, I guess. They need to hear how you're thinking and how your thought process is for instructions. It's nice. Did, I you, like it. did you notice a difference in your interaction with your audience when you started doing that? It, it's funny because when people, at the first voiceover video I did, all of my comments were like, thank God this girl's doing voiceovers now. I'm like, thanks guys, I hopped on board eventually. Yeah, sometimes like you try something that's like totally yeah. breaking or like experimenting with your own format and you're like, oh, they're going to hate this. And it's like, yeah, they're <laughs> all wanting it. They're yeah. all thinking the they're same like, thing. Whew. You're like, wow, thanks guys. It's like, you're the no, last like, person they were, but okay. <laughs> Becky Jane, you, you have segmented yours into three pretty specific channels. Do you find that that works? I mean, how, how much crossover is there, or do you try to really keep them separate? Ooh, well, I'm still trying to find that earlier, but yeah, I, I do completely segregate anything to do with art on my art channel. And it, even with vlogs, it's, it's very, I, I try to keep it as close to the art as possible, so I don't talk about things in my life unless it's directly relevant to the art itself. So I think what we were saying earlier about how your life can impact your art, like saying something about mental health, that, is, that has been a big, big, pretty big thing in my life. So I have been shaking really badly for a couple of months now. And of course, that is not only impacting my content on my other channels, but also my art itself. So there's been a few crossovers, but I'm getting there. It's, it's good not to completely cut yourself up, because then you can sort of lose things on different channels. It's just finding a happy medium where you know roughly what you're putting on each one. Hey, first of all, fantastic panel. Thank you guys for doing this. It's, it's been really great. And I'm not even an artist. <laughs> so, uh, my question is, is um, in the past year or so over on Twitch, the creative uh, category has really blown up as far as people going on there, doing their art, whether it's sculpting, playing music, art, or anything like that. Do any of you currently do any kind of live streaming while you're doing your art? Are you thinking about it? Because I think it's great, and I think it's also fun because of how you can interact through your chat with your viewers. Yeah, I've um, definitely, uh, like, I, my blog channel hit 50,000 subs, so we did a live stream celebration, which was amazing. And a lot of people are into watching live stream, and it's that kind of thing where I'm like, well, I kind of want to do this, but I don't know if they want it, and probably they do. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been interested in looking into it uh, obviously like equipment and making it quality is a big concern but um, yeah it sounds like just like another tool for like peeling back the curtains and having fun <laughs> I had a live stream on Twitch but I just did a live stream on Periscope maybe like a week and a half ago it's fun I mean it's different because like one thing that's nice about live streaming is that if you are reading the comments which I was um, they can answer you questions as you're going along. So instead of being like you're watching the full video, they'd be like, oh, I have a question about this, you know, this and that. They can literally ask you right then and there, and you can be like, hold on, let me explain your question now. So I, I do like that about live streaming as far as questions and interaction goes. Great. Thank you, guys. Hi, I'm different in person. On a personal note, I did want to say to the don't, don't hug me folks. Awesome. It was just, whoa. The first time I saw the video, my arms was blown. And, like, blood spatters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, I'm really passionate about online storytelling. And online video is a great format for me to do that. So I have a vlog channel, personally, same with well, I'll talk to me after. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I, I feel like digital art is a great way to add an element to online storytelling. But for someone like me who isn't invested in that community already, how would you recommend that I reach out to people to sort of collaborate on and make more detailed stories in that area? Anybody can answer that. I mean, I'd say if there's uh, 
if you know of any other creators like with channels or just online presence who do something that complements your work, whether it's um, like peas in a pod and you do very similar things, or if, um, I mean the only example I can think of is me, um, <laughs> where I do visual art and then music is a big part of it. And so music is not what I do and I need that from someone else, so why not reach out to somebody else who wants their music shared? Yeah, I mean collaboration, I think that collaboration is probably yeah, one of the most useful sort of tools when you're trying to reach out to more people. Firstly because you've got more than one sort of mind on it, so you're automatically thinking about things from you know, more than one point of view and, and you can start to sort of find kind of common ground. I think with me and Becky it's like worked out quite well in terms of us both finding um, finding sort of different roles and then kind of collaborating to make something that's greater than something we'd be able to do by ourselves. Actually, going back to music, I had a question for mainly Mary and you guys over at Doha. I know you guys just worked with Tim and Paul to work on a music video with them, and Mary, I know you've worked with Watsky and Nice Peter to work on art for their music. Uh, are you guys more focusing when you do your music videos and your art? Is it more seeing music from your perspective, how you want audience to see it? Or is it more like the artist comes to you and says, this is how we kind of want everyone to see our music? Um, for me, like, it just depends on the project. Um, sometimes, like, if a friend has a really amazing song uh, that they've already created, um, pointing at John to keep me in motion. Um, and we, we've done videos where uh, I've worked off of songs he's already recorded, as well as videos where I made the painting and I showed it to him and showed him a rough cut of the video, and he literally wrote a song to go with the video. Um, so it, I think it really does depend on um, what the project is and uh, you know if there's a musician looking for inspiration or are you the artist looking for inspiration. There's no rules, man. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, with bands and stuff like that, it's, I guess it's again it's like about collaboration and I think for us it was like um, we didn't want to do something um, that was just something we wanted to do. I think we wanted to do something that suited the music and the band and stuff like that with Tim and Parler. But um, at the same time, it was like also happened to be kind of a strange technique that we were like working on. Like, and they just they were just a great pairing. So with that, it was just like just lucky. Okay, uh, I have a loud voice, I wasn't sure how loud this was going to be. Uh, first off, congratulations to all of you being selected you that can actually do what you want for a living. Um, for those of us, unfortunately, who are still trying to do what we want for a living, uh, I don't know, of course, what your backgrounds have been like, but when you first started off doing your, your respective things, how did you work that around your work schedule that you already had? Like for me, myself, I work 40 hours a week, and it's mornings, nights, mids, everywhere. So how did you guys start off doing what you wanted to do? Um, when I started on YouTube, like as far as YouTube goes, I think that's what took up most of my time. Prior to YouTube, I was just painting and creating and doing whatever I want, when I wanted, whenever I had time. Um, when I first started YouTube, I was in school for aesthetics, so I was in school all day long. I just created at night. I mean, really, I just made it work with my schedule whenever I could. Like even if I had a like a idea the night before, I'd be like, okay, after school tomorrow, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, I think um, you know, after uni, like a group of us all like stayed in contact I and mean, we ended up getting a studio together. Um, but I think like the only way we could afford that studio was to have like jobs, so a lot of us were in part time jobs and stuff like that. And um, it took a, a long time for us to actually make money from like uh, our degree, like what we study, really. um, well, for me anyway, and I think I, I ended up waitressing and I just had a need to, to make stuff, so in all my spare time I would just go home and make stuff out of felt in my room. <laughs> um, and then eventually, yeah, I met Joe and he, he was like, hey, let's make a film, so 
I had like like his skill set as well because I think I felt a bit lost and like because I I could make stuff but I couldn't move it on to that next step and Joe did animation so I think we collaborated and both had that drive and just kept making stuff in our spare time. I guess I've got some tips, I suppose. Um, when you have got another professional background and you're trying to do like art in, art in the background, one thing that I love about it is that you can then feed on your passion. You're not doing it for a profession. So you can kind of use that time to help explore what you're good at. Um, and I guess because you're, you've got a limited amount of time, I mean, you've all got a limited amount of time, you've got an even less amount of time, um, trying so you can challenge yourself to create things in smaller time frames. Because um, I find just, Doing, just taking myself challenges really helps. Like even though I can do this, um, I don't know, uh, with, with more time than you I suppose at the moment, um, I still set myself periods. I don't just like spend six days on one painting. I do say, right, today I'm going to get this done and then I move on to something the next day. So time constraints can also help you be more creative sometimes. I hope that came across to me. Did your friend in the back? Oh my God. <laughs> 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 Did you make him? No, I, I, I don't have that much talent. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I use him, I do movie reviews myself. And so I use him as my face on YouTube. Thanks. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, you guys, how long, how long did it take before you started making a living on YouTube? Did you quantify that? How long did it take before you started making a living on YouTube? How long were you working for free? Or for, you know? Just because it was what you wanted to do. Yeah, at least two years, and I got a bump from a famous friend <laughs> in the beginning. Um, yeah, and it, it's like, it, it's this process of like slowly advancing up a level, like, you know, balancing the job and then, okay, I, I don't need to work as many hours on this job because I can now justify putting more time into my videos and um, slowly getting to that point where you're on the edge of the diving board and all you got to do is jump away from that security, that job, that thing that's been weighing you down the whole time. And th that's ultimately the scariest point when you get to that position where you can make that decision to cut the cord. Um, but it, it's a matter of like slowly advancing toward that. I think it probably took us about a year, I think. I mean, the, the first film sort of, it was a self-funded thing um, and it probably took us about six months to make if we were making it in all of our spare time whilst doing other jobs. But um, I think, yeah, we put it on YouTube and... Look, we, uh, had, like, <coughs> we had a good, like, maybe five million views on the first film, but we yeah. didn't monetize it either because we didn't know that you could... Yeah, we didn't realise you could turn that button on and actually make it. <laughs> and then they're like, damn it, we missed out there. But, um, yeah, a friend of ours was like, oh, by the way, you can just switch that button on and get the money. And we're like, great. Um, <laughs> we should have mentioned that five million years earlier. But, um, yeah, that definitely helped us. And then there, there's also little things like a show called Random Acts, which is great, which is a platform for. Um, new artists showing um, films on Channel 4, so that was like a, a small fee we got for that, but in the beginning it was all very like small incomings from it. I think for me, I, I started when I was 16, but I didn't earn uh, enough in order to like support myself until about three years ago. And suddenly I was like, oh gosh, maybe I can do this full time. I did it for a little bit, but I found that although I could support myself, suddenly depending on my art, and my videos full on. It, it sort of took away the creativity a little bit. You had that sort of demand. So then last year I took up a part-time job to sort of help balance it out. Also to get me out of the house, to get me talking to people. Because when you're creating content in your own, you don't see anybody, as we said earlier. Um, so I do find that although you can depend on your, on your art, sometimes it's also good to have like a backup plan or once every now and again just go out into the world and try something different. And again, that can give you more inspiration as well. Yeah, I'm gonna say about like, you know, not knowing to monetize your videos, because I did that for about a year and a half, so I totally understand you with that. But uh, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because although you absolutely can make a living on YouTube, I guess this is kind of gonna be a weird answer. Um, 
although you can make a living on YouTube, I think a lot of people go onto YouTube expecting to make a living now, and I wouldn't do that. I would go onto YouTube just doing it because you love it. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about how much money you're gonna make. If you make a buck, cool, make thousand dollars, way better. But you know, it's it's about doing what you love. And for me, I went to school for aesthetics. Um, so I'm also a licensed esthetician. I'm licensed in skincare. I am licensed in cosmetology, which is hair. I own my own business. So there's a lot of different branches that you can go apart from just making content on YouTube or just creating art. There's so many different avenues that can open up. I think that when you get on YouTube, whether you're creating art or you're painting or you're doing whatever, you know, it opens up so many different things that you never thought that you would even come across before. YouTube might lead you into a passion for film, for lighting, for editing. There's so much more than just monetizing your content. It's a lot about growing and learning and just moving forward. Practical question. I don't think this media is on paper, sometimes canvas. Do you have any tips on lighting so it doesn't just completely blow out the uh, thing? Uh, I found a good, cheap lighting hack. Uh, I, I keep going back to just using like clamp lights that you can get at hardware stores. And then, and then parchment paper for cooking. Yeah. Like the, the waxy stuff that is no stick and um, diffusing it and just making it as soft as possible and um, and trying to get like from the sides or front to the sides and then blasting light all over the room to like kind of softly bounce it. Um, yeah, it's definitely like a trial and error everywhere I go and I feel like I'm adjusting it every few months or if I'm tracking the painting, it's just a, it's a constant struggle. Yeah, on, on Mary's point too, how she said parchment paper, make sure it is parchment paper and not paper that's going to set on fire from your lights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just let me know. Yeah. Hi. So, being an artist is weird. The way that we traditionally look at artists is like that person who holds up in their bedroom and makes work and doesn't show it to anybody. And so what you guys are doing is unique in that you are making things for millions of people to look at and to watch you do. My question is, is there any artwork that you make on your own that you're never showing anyone? Let's see this stuff just for yourself. I know, the whole panel's like, yes, absolutely, yes, of course, definitely. Yeah, I, I paint on my spare time on canvas and stuff too. Um, I just painted some bracelets. I most of the time now I always post a picture of it. I don't make tutorials for everything. I always paint on my spare time as well. Keeps me sharp. <laughs> And it is nice to do things like when I'm painting not for the camera, it's so nice. It's sort of like going back and like talking with an old friend and you don't have any of those pressures from work that you're feeling every day. It's I, I highly recommend it. Do something for fun because you did it for fun before. Thank you. Right. Can we get through the last few questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm a photographer in Santa Cruz, California, and I'm also a high school student, and I feel like for many people my age, a first step for them is social media. And I was curious to know, how do you go beyond just social media? Like, do you have any tips to go beyond, like, yeah, social media, basically? Like IRL? <laughs> um, I think that's a challenge. <laughs> uh, all right, let me tell you. So you're in high school right now. You have such an advantage for being like into photography and stuff because you're not going to be in high school forever. Ta da! So all of your classmates and everything, eventually they're going to need photographers for stuff. You know, take advantage right now while you're going to have models that you can use in high school. Use your friends. You know, once you're out of high school, they're going to be like, oh. There was this kid that's in photography in my class. We should hire him. We should look him up. So that kind of can connect with social media because then it's like you can bring them back to your page or your channel or whatever network you're using. And then they'll share your work. They'll share your work. And it's just honestly, high school is crazy, but it's such a good time to make connections with your peers because, like I said, you won't be there forever. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to say, um, seeing people like artists up here on stage and who are actually successful in doing what they want for a living is incredibly motivating for someone like me who's scared of taking a first step into art. Um, but my question was, what about your art is fulfilling to you? What gives you fulfillment in your art? I guess for me at the moment I'm using it a little bit like therapy because I have got the three channels and I just find it really calming to just sit and go and paint for like, I don't know, two, three hours and relax. I don't treat it too much like work. If I can turn it into a video, that's fantastic, but it's, it's like an outlet for me. I completely agree. Art is it's such a stress reliever. It doesn't matter what I'm painting myself into. I can be painting myself into a superhero or something very, very complicated that takes many hours to do. But regardless, I completely agree. It's relaxing, it's therapeutic, and it's, it's nice when you're on social media and you are able to share your art that you're able to inspire somebody else. Like, don't be afraid of, of getting into art. Like, there's no wrong in art. And I think that's the best thing, is that it's really just, it's just you. And that's it. Yeah, it's, um, I think, and it sounds so cheesy, but like the fulfilling thing is like this whole weekend and like seeing, seeing and meeting face to face people who are affected and like saw something, even if it's like something that I didn't feel was my best work, like they got something from it. And somehow the thing I love to do once shared is either like help someone else and also knowing that if, I share it and it's not the best thing in the world. At least my failures don't kill anyone. Like, I don't keep falling over. Like, and, and getting over that mental hurdle of like, what if I fail at this? And then you do fail and you're like, oh. And so that's what failure is. That's, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Uh, thank you. Joe, thank you. Do you have final, um, final thoughts on. I guess it's kind of a bit of a absurd way to spend your time, isn't it? Um, but it's also something that, I guess I don't really know what, what the continuing thing is about art, but for some reason we do it and there's something in that, I guess, it's just a sort of strange feeling that you get and, and maybe you're not supposed to know. <laughs> Alright, well, I think that's our time. You guys ask great questions. Let's um, give a hand. <laughs>